Our speaker, who kindly agreed to speak today, is Dr. Ryan Harrod. He is an assistant professor in anthropology at UAA. He specializes in biological anthropology with research and expertise in bioarchaeology, paleopathology, and forensic anthropology. He's interested in questions of identity, health and disease, conflict and violence, social inequality, ethics, and repatriation. He has studied Native American populations through the Western U.S. and a historical group of immigrant Chinese to the U.S. He's co-author of several books, and he's working on his own book. I'm delighted to introduce him today, and thank you. We should all be clapping for the end in case it's not any good. Move this up. All right, so um, for this talk, I wanted to talk about reading the bones, ways that we think about um, how we can tell somebody's life history from their story from their human remains, right? Seems kind of gruesome, but I've looked at lots of dead people, lots and lots of them, lots of museums all over the world, and you can tell a lot from your human remains. Um, I stole this tile from my professor's professor who wrote this right before he died. He wrote an article for science called Reading the Bones, and he was a paleopathologist that wanted to understand disease throughout all human history. So he had published a lot on it, George Amelgus. So it's kind of in tribute to him. So some of my interests that she already mentioned. This is my son who's sitting there. We, uh, this is us digging. No human remains, all animal remains. Um, the headless individual that's shown right below that was one of my favorite burials I worked on. Had no head, but it had cowboy boots on. So immediately it became a cowboy, right? It was a male. Analysis of the actual bones revealed that it was a female, a large female, but it was a large female buried right next to a smaller female. So immediately the story was, it was a man and his wife and they had died and so on and so forth. But the historic records actually didn't support that. And then her boots were also very nicely patterned on the bottom with floral stuff and she had a nice shirt that was also a female shirt. So more interesting than that, in the pocket of that shirt, we pulled out a newspaper article with the date, so we know exactly when she was buried in that hill. And uh, it was the worst winter in 50 years, so that's why they buried her in the sand, and that's why she eroded out of the sand. Anyway, some of these others are Grasshopper Pueblo, which is a famous site in the southwest where they were, um, there's some evidence of scalping, which I was going to show, but it was kind of a tangent off. But there is some evidence of scalping there and some warfare. The next individual I will talk about later is a Chinese immigrant. Um, Southwest, my daughter there at, that one is Chaco Canyon, Pueblo Benito, and the little door. And then the Turkana above that were a population that I sent an anthropologist that actually talks to living people to go and see them and talk to them because they do active raiding today. So we could go and see head wounds, we could go see some violence, and then I could use that to infer some more about the past. But, so what is a biological anthropologist? I had this question from an engineer the other day. I was in the, his office and he's like, what is biological anthropology? I'm like, well, I study anything that has to do with humans in lots of different ways, but mostly bones. My interests are mostly in this secondary part here. I'm interested in bioarchaeology, paleopathology, and forensic anthropology. These ideas that, what well, we can look at the skeletons in either a legal context or you can look at it in thousand-year-old context and still say something about who these people were. So biological anthropologists do a lot of other things. There's Jane Goodall who's studying chimpanzees. You have uh, people that are just studying things like nutrition and diabetes. Paleoanthropologists that find new fossils like Naledi. You guys saw the news articles on the new fossils that are coming out of South Africa. Those kind of people are there as well. And then skeletal well, biology and osteologists, that's more of a method. All of us use osteology and I'll talk about what that is. So bioarchaeology, this is one site that's kind of interesting to look at. You can see that we have burials. They're in the, we recover them. We recover the context of the burials. That's where the bioarchaeology comes in. Most of the time, if I'm going to work on human remains, I like to go to the site where they're actually digging up the human remains. In the old days, they used to just send us boxes like this, and then they just give, just give me a skull. And be like, tell me what that is. I'm like, OK. <laughs> so you'd be like, well, you have a male, so-and-so age, 
Uh, this individual had artificial cranial deformation. They had survived brain surgery, so trepanation that healed, right? So I could give you that much, but other than that, that's where it ends, right? I don't know anything else. I have a skull. If I had the whole body and I had the context, I might know that this individual was buried in an elite status, maybe had more grave goods than other people in the society, might have been held high. I do know this individual's high status. My colleagues work on these sites. Anybody that has shaped heads like this, it's a sign from birth that you're higher status individual, right? You did this on purpose. I tried to convince my wife to let me do it to one of our kids. <laughs> she said no, obviously. If you look at their heads, they're, they're normal. One of them's a little misshapen, but mostly normal. So forensic anthropology, on the other hand, is when you do this kind of stuff in a legal context, when you're working with the medical examiner and you're doing stuff for the police. I've done this in Las Vegas, where they make CSI. It's not as exciting as what it looks like, but it is interesting. You go into legal context and you can do things like help figure out age, sex, identify general characteristics so they can narrow down their search and also start to identify the person. There's some really exciting cases that I make my students watch, but that's not usually the case. Most of the time I have like hiker lost and their body just turned up in the desert. I'm like, okay, this is the hiker. And we identify them and then contact the next of kin. So forensic anthropology is just that different context. But you can do mass disasters. Um, you can work on, again, local police cases. They have things like the body farm that you may or may not have heard of. This is where they bury people. They don't always bury people. Sometimes they put people in like wood chippers, they put people in trees, and they do all kinds of things to watch how they decompose so that if we do find a body, we can go and analyze what happened, right? I did this with bears in Anchorage. My students, some of them were out there. They had to dig up bears. Some of them were not quite done <laughs> decomposing. Tyler can tell you about that as he took off fur off one of the bears. He, anyway, not quite done. So osteology, what is osteology? Osteology is used by lots of people. Some of my colleagues teach at medical schools. They teach anatomy for different schools. University of New Mexico is an example. Um, so that you can teach anatomy. You can do forensics, but you can do paleontologists. All of them have to use osteology. If you're going to identify a fossil, you have to be able to know what the shape of each feature of the bone is. Uh, physical anthropology and archaeology. So we're going to talk about some of the more archaeological examples today, but I'll get into some of the forensics, like gunshot wounds, that stuff. So reading the bones, what does that even mean? I told my students they have to, just, they have to make osteobiographies. My grad students are going to do this thing. Saul coined this term in 1972, I believe. The idea is that what you're doing is you take the bones and you write a story about that person's life. It's not so much a fiction, it's all about what you can actually say, right? I can tell you what disease they had. I can tell you how old they were. I can tell you whether they're male or female. I can tell you if they had trauma. And then with all of that, I can write a narrative about one person. Then I can do it with 100. I've done it with 200 at one site one time. It takes a long time. <laughs> but the bones reveal many levels, what this person was doing in their life, what things affected them, what insulted the bones, all kinds of things. So these are just some examples of different anatomical elements. Ah, whoops. So an osteobiography requires age at death, sex estimation, stature, nutrition, disease, physique, general size and shape of the bones. I've seen really heavy bones. We have a 2,000-year-old site in the UAE where they have these individuals that have bones that look like they're Neanderthals. They're not Neanderthals, but they have these huge, robust bones, and they're doing fishing primarily. They're maritime. They're doing enough that we looked at 487 patella, which is horrible, by the way. That's your kneecap. 487 kneecaps is... Don't ever do that. Anyway, but we looked at 487 of them, and what we could tell you is that m a lot of them had these fractures. So they were actually pulling bone away from their knees as they were doing this labor, and they were doing a lot of twisting. So we looked at athletes, and we looked at athletes that have the same injuries, and we saw what kind of injury, what kind of mechanism would cause, cause that. So physique's important. Occupation, we'll talk about Chinese railroad workers, lifestyle, trauma, and burial practices, which is important. This isn't always easy. This is me at the uh, Smithsonian. I'm putting the skull back together, just pieces of it with my hand, so I can look at some aspects of it. And this one's well-preserved, right? A lot of them are not like this. In the old days, we just glue them all back together, but we don't do that anymore because every t we glue every time we analyze them, we glue them back together. They start to break down, they start to look a little funny, and then we start to lose things that are important. 
So the reality is, if we get a really good preserved skull like this one that they're able to make a cast of, that's amazing. But a lot of times we get stuff like that. And especially if it goes into somebody's lab, like my lab, and then I have students look at it for 10 years, it's definitely going to look like that at the end, right? Because people are going to be like, oh, whoops, I dropped one. <laughs> no. All right. So, oh. so what do the bones reveal? There's lots of things you can look at, but we've talked about them. But I kind of made this little model for my dissertation to kind of give you an idea of what I do. Whenever I do analysis, I pull from forensic science. I read lots of forensic science literature. I pull from cultural anthropology. I have to read about living people because anything I say about bones, they were once living people. Archaeologists, I work with lots of them. I go out in the field with them. They're great. They know a lot more about context than me. And then biological anthropology, obviously. But we look at sex, age, diet, pathology, trauma, behavior, disease, lifestyle, and political economy. The one at the bottom here is a famous burial that has just been repatriated, thankfully. It's back to the Native American group that it was represented. It has been in the collection for probably 60 plus years, but this is the magician's burial. And all those grave goods you can see, maybe see, down there are associated with that burial. And it's also a high status individual, has lots of indicators of good nutrition. But it was reanalyzed and now it's been reinterred. And so nobody will analyze it again. But we have lots of information because of bioarchaeologists spent a good portion of time looking at it. So what about, the, what are the factors we have to consider when we look at a body? It's not just your body, right? It's all the things that you could possibly do. We have to look at the culture you come from. We have to look at the society you're from. There's one of my Chinese individuals. This is actually, a, he's actually a logger. A lot of the railroad workers became loggers and they were really, well, really good at getting timbers. And so there's a new book out by Su Fang Chung that's all about Chinese loggers. But pathological pathways, genetic factors, individual risk factors, social relationships, living conditions, neighborhoods and communities, institutions. A colleague of mine looked at African-American bones that were donated to science, donated to science early on, and a lot of those were individuals that were put into mentally insane asylums at the time. Now we would call them state hospitals. But the, a lot of the trauma that they saw, they originally described it as domestic violence that Husbands were hitting their wives, and then they were fighting with each other. Turns out they actually had records and they could read them, and it actually all came from being inside the institution. Most of the trauma was from being in these hospitals and either the patients falling down, other patients attacking them, or the orderlies hitting them and the abuse going on there. So again, institutions are important to think about, and social, political, economic policies. We'll talk about the Chinese. There was policies that were put in place to exclude Chinese, get them out of the country. And so that had a major effect. If you're targeted as a other, they try to get you out. It's going to maybe affect the way you live and your health. So we go from the living individual to the bones. We're going to try to do that in reverse. We're going to try to look at the bones, get back to the person. Some things to think about is osteology. We talked about it, but it's basically just the study of bones. That's why calling myself an osteologist would be kind of odd. I just, I'm a scientist, I study bones. So it's kind of true, but I do it in different contexts. Odontology is the study of teeth. I, I do less of that. I like teeth, but not that much. And then skeleton, it just means dried up. And that's why I like it. A lot of my forensic students found out quickly they don't want to go into forensics because they like skeletons that are dried up as well. Once we had the flesh on there, most of them decided against that idea. I think two, two of them, two out of 25 said, oh, I might still want to do this. The rest of them were done. <laughs> and I don't blame them. Anyway, so we're going to go and we're going to look at some bones and try to see what we can see. So bodies tell stories, right? Oftentimes, we think this tells the biggest story. And it can, but this sometimes only tells me a story about what people think about that person after they die, right? I, you don't bury yourselves. Ideally, you might put it in your will. Maybe that will go through, maybe it won't. I'll give you a personal example. My grandmother had in her will that she would be buried someplace. She was buried there. Then her husband moved her body without telling any of the rest of the family and had her buried on top of him when he died. So sometimes that stuff doesn't work out, right? Yeah, I had to break the news to my dad. He was excited. Anyway, uh, burial patterns reveal how communities see the person, right? There's examples of slaves and captives that are sacrificed, and then before they're sacrificed or after they're sacrificed, they're venerated. So they're buried with a lot of grave goods. They're buried in a kind of a big manner, but it doesn't mean that they were ever holding that status in life. It's what the people did afterwards, right? So that's important to think about. And Jane Bykstra, she has all the credit for stating that. 
bones, though, I do offer a way to look at the person themselves. And this is just one lady. I was going to talk about them more, but I excluded them out just for time's sake. I could talk forever. Um, this is a lady from the Southwest. She was buried as you see her in the ground. She was on her back. Her arms and legs were sticking out to the side. She has a severe cranial depression fracture in the top of her head. We worked with a neurologist to see what that might mean. The neurologist said that if, with, those, with that fracture, she probably shouldn't have lived, but she did. And then she would have had severe neurological problems. And you can see that she also had some hip issues. She had some other things going on. But when she died, they just threw her in the bottom of a hole, and then they just threw stuff on top of her. They didn't put any grave goods with her. They didn't have anything with her. We found 12 individuals like this, and nine of them were buried like this in different ways, and then three of them were buried with grave goods, and they had no trauma at all. And so my professor thinks that they were probably captives and slaves, that these are examples of people that were taken non-locally. We can do isotopic studies, and we can tell where people come from, and they've done this in Peru, and it's really common that you have women that are raided for, captured, and then they are buried without grave goods. So again, the bones can reveal that where the bodies don't. Um, Again, just looking at different burial contexts, stuff that might be familiar to some of you. Um, there's mummies in there for the people that are interested in Egypt and Egyptology. Uh, grave goods, this would be your traditional type burial where you would have somebody in a flex position with grave goods. That would be what you expect. Most of the stuff I work on in the Southwest, people are found just like that. That's what you see. Um, that one up at the top there is one of my favorite burials. It is found in the Middle East, Near East, and that is a female with two children. Now, some people assume it's a mother, her two children. I don't think they've done the DNA yet to prove that. But the interesting thing is that the individuals are holding each other's hands. Their fingers are intertwined. So the only way that could happen is before death and after, before decomp, they had to have their fingers put together. So they're facing one another, fingers entwined. I really like it, but then my wife and my kids are kind of that age, so that's kind of weird, maybe. I don't know. I don't want you guys yeah. <laughs> no, stay alive. I'm just saying. I like that one. Um, things we can see on the body. This is just a, Clark Larson has this example he's used for years. But all these different indications that you can see. The head shape has changed over time. I'm working with some people now that look at this in Alaska. But head shape changes as a result of dietary shifts, as a result of all kinds of other things, usage. Um, we, have, we can look at teeth, we can look at microscopic levels of the teeth and look to see what people ate. It leaves abrasions on your teeth. Um, there's an anthropologist who used to be up here in Alaska, now in Reno, that is looking at your tartar on your teeth. They're scraping it off and they're sending it off and they're analyzing it so you can see what people are eating over their lifetime. We have dental caries, we have degenerative joint disease, osteoarthritis, you have fractures, spinal changes, caries, Osteoporosis, I use this guy at the very beginning. I use him in a lot of things because he he's a great indicator, a great example of somebody that they think worked themselves to the bone, essentially, right? And it's uh, somebody out of the Near East and he looks like he, the strap across his chest is, this is ethnographic account and then she's using it to show what she's finding on the bioarchaeological remains to suggest this might be what it has. I use this as my little sign in my office for my grad students, it could be worse. Right? When every time they complain, I'm like, this could be your job. So I wanted to give you some case studies that I thought were interesting that might be kind of fun to look at. But before we do that, we just have to do a couple of little things. First, we have to talk about how you estimate the age of a skeleton. My students in osteology have to learn this. A lot of them don't like it. It takes a while. It takes practice. Um, but it's easy to know that they're children and they're adults, right? We, we can see that. And we know that they change over time. So you have a newborn, a one-year-old, a five-year-old. Things are growing, things are fusing, the head's getting bigger. We can easily track this growth and development over time, right? One of my students, I sent her off to Utah, of all places, to go and study human remains there. And she studied, I think, 76 children remains. She wasn't super excited about it at first, because if you've ever analyzed children's remains, really little kids, it's like, babies. It's really hard to do, but she did a really good job and she found lots of evidence of different social status in the society. So it's kind of interesting. Some things to think about is teeth. Everybody knows teeth eruption. That one's easy to do. Uh, you can see how teeth are starting to erupt and then we can look at long bone fusion when things are starting to fuse together as your long bones grow, certain things fuse on there. I have a bunch of kids in that box over there, little kid bones. Not 
kids <laughs> that you can look at. They're all fake. You can look at them when we're done. I'm like, I just collect kids. No, uh, they, they're in that box. <laughs> Sounds odd. Permanent baby teeth. Easy to age. My students are learning how that which ca which area you put them in. Um, for fun, I had a little in class quiz trick. Some of them might remember. I gave them a child skull. Child skull is about the size of an adult skull, but it had only baby teeth in there. But they all thought that the second molar coming in was actually the third molar, and so they put the age at 17 to 25. It was much younger, right? But it's all part of learning how to do this. You gotta learn how to see the teeth and count how many are actually in the mouth when you're analyzing teeth. Estimating adults can be tricky. I say that because I've seen lots of different ways people have done this. And I go to the paleopathology conference, you go to the forensic conference, people are always refining these estimates. We're trying to get better at it. And the way, the reason adults are tricky is because we stop growing basically, right? So the way you do it is you look at how they're falling apart. <laughs> You're looking at what things are going, or how sutures are closing. But suture closure is tricky. They, we've had that for a long time, but now we're finding people that are young with closed sutures, older people with open sutures. But we still use it. We just have to be cautious and know what you're looking at. Rib changes, as things start to, start to ossify, you can see changes there. You can look at the pelvis. That's that same female pelvis, just to highlight there, the, the changes that she has. So we're looking at degeneration with age. That's how we're estimating. So adults, we get into ranges. And if you ever really read the ranges that they give you, and I'll show you the box over here, and you can look at that with the pelvis, and it shows you different ages. There's like plus or minus 10 to 15 years. It's like, hmm, that's super accurate, but it gets us there, right? So some of these degenerative changes. Pelvis is the best because it's been fairly standardized. In 1920, Todd looked at a bunch of Korean and US soldiers and made his charts. And then we've had Suchi Brooks, Suchi and Brooks came along and they re kind of revitalized that and changed it, made it better. But this pubic synthesis, this bone right here, this starts to change over time. Then you can look at the young adult. It's all billowy. The old adult, not so much, right? And so we can put them in these phases. Auricular surface is back here where your sacrum attaches. That's the same idea. It's a lot harder to age. You have to learn the different features. And you have to look at different changes of different places. So just to see some of the pelvis changes, we won't spend a long time on it. You're not going to age anybody. Ribs and aging, this is again showing you some just how this looks. You look at that rib, that's young, the bottom rib over there is older, and again, you can put them in categories. And I've used these in different cases and different things just because you've every age estimate you used and you can kind of calibrate your age. Other indicators can just be things like presence and of the loss of bone density, curvature of the spine, loss of teeth can be useful. Um, Last conference I was at, somebody was trying to estimate when you lose a tooth, how fast does the bone start to resorb or get small and skinny like that? And they're trying to change our age estimates. They the goal for this is to get over 50 and be able to accurately age over 50. They've done it like once, <laughs> but this once isn't always good enough. Anyway, but they got some 86-year-old woman and I think they, they nailed it and they're like, yeah, oh, look, but then they couldn't do it again. So <laughs> what we're looking at is just basically bone formation and resorption, right? So you have bone development, as a child and th through your adult years, you're growing, right? Then we have maintenance of bone and then we're gonna more and more loss. As we age, we get less and less bone density. Things start to decline, right? So basically I tell my students, once you hit like 18, you start to die, right? Everything starts to change. It's depressing, but hey, we got more medicine, we can live longer. So okay, we got to age. Step two is to identify biological sex, right? So we, can, we know there's differences between males and females. It's slight. Sexual dimorphism is slight, but there, it's there. So we can look at hormonally controlled changes in puberty. We can look at growth and development changes. And the biggest one, what's the biggest change that we'd look for between the sexes? What would be the most different? Oh, the, the head would be good. What else? The pelvis. Why the pelvis? Right? <laughs> the baby's got to come out. So... This is the one we use a lot. And unless the pelvis is broken, which is sad, or missing, I, can, I cannot tell you how many museums I've been to where all they have is heads because old physical anthropologists like to collect these things. And then they'd run around measuring them. And then they'd make books about measurements of heads. But they left all the other bones there, right? So we have lots of heads in museums. It's, it's kind of a problem, but that's all right. So the graphic down there does show birth. That's kind of supposed to be like homo erectus, but 
there's a baby in there. But the idea being the whole other female is much larger than a male. And then all these associated changes we can identify. And so we train the students how to do this. Right? So age and sex we could do. And again, here's a picture just to show you even more. This is comparison over time. But basically the head shape, the pelvis shape, they have to be correlated or the baby's not going to come out. With the crania, we can also do it. But it's a little less uh, definitive. You get a lot of probable female, that little question mark there. You get a lot of probable male, that little question mark on number four. Um, I unfortunately, for some of my features, fall into probable male. I'm a little upset about it, but it's okay. I fill them all the time like, oh, shoot, it'd be a four. That's <laughs> not good. I don't, I, don't, my, I don't know if I have any threes, but that happens too. Sometimes you'll have a skull that looks female, but it will be a pelvis that's clearly male or vice versa, right? You'll have either or. So a lot of like making sure you know your population and making sure you know your variation. Um, the three, the ambiguous, about 10% of skeletons on average can't be identified biological sex is a rule of thumb. So one of the biological anthropologists did the statistics on that, but that's a lot of skeletons if you think about it that we're kind of in this fuzzy area about. We can sometimes get there, but there are some. So those ones just get left out of the analysis, right? We're going to look at males and females, and then we're like, eh, and there's these other ones. But we won't talk about them. Uh, cranial sex, just to show you some of these traits. You can see the male and the female. There's just some differences. You don't have to know these terms at all. But the mastoid, the nuchal area, the gabella, the brow ridge, the superorbital rim, zygomatic process, all these things where there are changes, right? And just point some arrows at them. <laughs> Fun one if you want to feel your own. Feel right here on your neck. You can feel your neck muscles. These things, mastoids get bigger on males, smaller females. Back of your skull, you can feel there too, the nuchal area. If you're really interested, you can feel un in between your eye and your skull. Just be careful, don't poke your eye. <laughs> you can feel the uh, little bit of the uh, supraorbital rim. And if it's blunted, you're a male. If it's kind of sharp, you're a female. But you probably already know that, so <laughs> we'll move on. Right? I won't tell you what you are. I'm just saying that's what we look for. Step three, though, is to identify stress and trauma. So now that we have the basic demographics, that's great. I know that they're males. I know they're females. I know they're adults. I know they're kids. Now I want to know, like, all the other information, right? Who were these people? So we look at addition of bone, the loss of bone. Basically, Don Ortner describes it in his book. If you've ever read the book on all the paleopathology that you can look at, all the things you can identify in the bone, like this, which I'll show again, but this is syphilis. Stage three, be glad we don't get that. But you can see what it's doing to the inside of your skull. And you can see what it's doing to the outside of your skull. And you can imagine why, what it's doing to your brain, right? So safe sex, good idea. Addition of bone, loss of bone, but we can predict things. And so what we do is we look at certain bones and we look at what's changing on those bones. And that can help us identify diseases. An example, rickets and scurvy right now. There's a bunch of people out there trying to differentially diagnose them because they're actually very similar in little kids, really young infants. So they're looking at certain bones. And there's like the temporal bones really important. And right before he died, Don Ortner, the really well-known uh, paleopathologist, wrote about this disease. This is his last publication, talking about trying to get better at this. So childhood stress, since we're talking about it, we can talk about indicators of poor health. It can include things like enamel hypoplasias, these little lines on your teeth. Sometimes you have them. You can see them in the mirror if you're at home. You can feel them with a fingernail if you have them. It's just these little disruptions in growth. The one showing you there is cribra orbitalia, those little porosity in the eye sockets there. Um, it's anemia, but it used to be associated with iron. It's not iron. It's a couple other things like B12, but basically not enough nutrients, right? And if we see that, you get it as a kid, it will heal, but it won't completely heal in adulthood. And so this is an adult with the remnants of it. Infection on the long bones. This is an infected long bone. You can see periosteal reaction or reaction on the outside surface of the bone. And then product hypostosis, which is this porosity on the head. This one has some taphonomic changes too, but they're basically the same kind of idea. You have anemia differences and nutritional deficiencies. So we can see this on the bone too. They used to be the same disease, but they've been separated. Some people think they have different pathways, but they're related. So lots of debate about what these things are. The other one is stature. We can just measure how tall you are, right? I did this one for my dissertation as one of my measures. The um, thing about stature is stature is affected by nutrition. This little picture on the side here I use for my class to talk about human variation. But this, and this is one generation of change, and it's the nutrition levels have shifted, right? So his dad is much shorter than he is, and it's the same population, 
same group, but we can see shifts. If you look at this bottom chart, you see Brazilian boys and girls that don't have adequate nutrition, and you see the, where the American percentages are. And there was a lot of rebound growth, but they're on average a little bit shorter. But if the nutrition goes up, then they reach a potentially the same general size, height, variations, changes within populations. But we do this by putting these bones on these osteometric boards and measuring them, right? A bunch of different measurements to get at what's going on. So we got stature. We have age-related changes in general. So we talked about osteoarthritis. You talked about degenerative joint disease. These two here are showing where the cartilage is completely worn away and the bone's actually rubbing on bone. Um, doctors often don't see this now because we prevent this, right? You can get knee replacements. You can do all kinds of things. But some of these cultures, I mean, this is, you just lived with it and it just kept going. We uh, looked at a woman from the Southwest that broke her pelvis and then she had all kinds of changes, stuff like this, and she just made it through until she was in her mid-20s and then not anymore. Um, other age-related changes that can be there are actual insertion sites on each little tendon muscle where you can look for them, and we score those now, and we have a system. They uh, did this in Portugal. There was a whole group of them. They had a group of historic Portuguese of something like 1,000-plus burials that had records of what their occupations were, what they were doing, and so they got together, a bunch of them, and they analyzed all of them, and then they started scoring things like this, coming up with a standard system that they could do. And that's the best way we can do this is we have a whole bunch of them, but we often don't have very many burials. If you've ever seen an archaeological dig or you've been on one, they look like that one I showed you at the beginning. It was all broken, or you don't have any, right? We might not even dig up the burials. We might skip them. All right, so I think this is just age-related changes again. I just wanted to show you more. Broken hip, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, but here's our syphilis, infectious diseases. This is syphilis on the skull. This is the actual cast that I have in my hand from a real individual that was cast. So when you look at this, if you come look at this, you can see the actual syphilis. This is tuberculosis. I think I have tuberculosis in here of the pelvis. Should be in here. And I have a femur that's modified from it, but you can see that it does some bad things. You get these holes in your head if you get really bad tuberculosis, so not so good. My specialty is traumatic injury. I study lots of cranial depression fractures. I've looked at lots and lots of crania. I've cast them. I've put my thumb in a lot of cranial depression fractures, measured them, analyzed them, took death. Anything you could think of, I 3D scan them now so I can get them and preserve them. But any kind of cranial depression fractures. I have slight ones. This individual just has a slight one there but he also has one on the back over here that you can't see so well. There's another one. This individual has a very large cranial depression fracture. This person has a large one, but it's fairly shallow. So each one of those gets described a little different, but each one of those is injury that they sustained while they're alive and they live through, right? These are not those kinds of injuries. This individual was hit in the top of the, in the forehead with a stone ax. Didn't make it. Same with that individual over there. And that was individuals there, right? So this uh, lethal trauma is also there, and we're studying that all the time. In historic context, we get gunshot wounds and stuff like that. But in the bioarchaeological record, I mean, people have been killing each other for a very, very long time. I'm reviewing a book right now that's hunter-gatherer warfare, so they're talking about it like 10,000 years ago. Some of the data is sketchy, but definitely after agriculture, we've been killing each other for a long time. So with all that, I want to really try to give you two case studies, just real interesting one. Well, I think they're interesting. They're both from Nevada, which is where I was from, so kind of makes sense. Um, Carlin is up there, where you can see the star, and Las Vegas is down there. So I'm sure you guys know where Las Vegas is. There's uh, Carlin in Las Vegas, and in Carlin, we have railroad workers that were, they had worked on the railroad, but then they had retired and lived in a small town of Carlin. They were shopkeepers, there were merchants, there were Miners at that point. One of our individuals was mummified and he still had arsenic in his hair and he probably had TB, so we didn't work with him a lot. He was covered up. Although they just put a sheet over him in the lab and left him there. I'm like, that's still open. Anyway, uh, <laughs> they're like, you'll be fine. Nobody's died yet. I'm like, okay. All right, cowboys, we'll talk about in Carla, in, or sorry, in North Las Vegas. So here are some Chinese workers building the railroad. This is a famous shot. I was in Stanford. With, uh, there's a big project looking at railroad workers in, across the world. They're doing this, they're just growing this project, trying to look at railroad workers and the Chinese contribution to it. And this is one of the shots they have. They've got, ethno they've got ethnographies now of some of this, but the Chinese writing wasn't, a, there wasn't a lot of it, but there's oral traditions passed down to generations. So my grandpa, my great grandpa told me this story about being 
a Chinese miner. We have log books about what the Chinese were doing, all kinds of things. They were really good at this process, which is planing this stuff so that they could lay the track. They were supposedly the, some of the best and the fastest with shovels. You just give them shovels and they would clear it really quickly. So these individuals, I want to know about who they were, what life was like. So we had some human remains, 13 male individuals. Um, one, one that was mummified, he's at the bottom there. If you want to see what a natural mummy looks like, it's not like an Egyptian mummy. It's, it's not. Anyway, he was there. We have analyzed him. We did x-rays on him, all that kind of stuff. But he's not part of what I'm talking about right now. I do mention him. That other individual has multiple cranial depression fractures and that really severely broken leg. I'll show you a bigger picture of that. This is where they were, this is where they were housed in University of Nevada, Las Vegas, back in those shelves. Um, the context for this is that once the railroad was done, there was a lot of groups that wanted them out. These are some of the petitions. There were riots. There were people attacking people in the streets. If you read some of the newspaper articles about Las Vegas, or sorry, Nevada, about Chinese railroad workers, you'll hear about Chinese people dying and nobody really making a big deal of it and that they were likely killed. And I'll talk about one that we have that was killed. There's, again, anti-Chinese sentiment. To give you like some kind of numbered sense of what this was like in the county of Idaho that I lived in, there were 90% Chinese at this time period. They're less than 1% today because they excluded them and they sent them home, right? And they wouldn't allow them to stay. So most of the bodies, unlike these 13 individuals, were sent back to China. And they're actually in a big warehouse in the Guajang province, which we're going to go look at potentially go over there and they just sit in this giant warehouse. But the ones that were still here, they got dug up eventually as they started to expand the cemetery because the, bar the burials were outside of the cemetery boundaries. They weren't allowed to be in the European, Euro-American side of the cemetery, right? They're over here. There's some inequality we can see on the bones. Uh, published on this with my advisor a few times, but we've talked about non-lethal injuries. Lethal injuries obviously get violence. Hard labor, we can see overuse of your muscles, activity changes, degenerative spine, all kinds of stuff that would start to show up. And then inequality would be nutritional deficiencies and other type of pathologies that certain people have, like that leg that's not being set really well versus people that are getting bones set at this time, right? What's going on? Why is some, some individuals aren't doing as well? Um, these are kind of graphic, but just so you have an idea, this is some of the individuals. The one with the broken ribs was crushed by a mine cart. So accidental, but the risk of being a miner. Um, that one has a healed facial fracture, the cheek, the healed broken leg that wasn't set very well. Individual had been a lot shorter on one side. And that individual over there had a severe cranial fracture. And there was a coroner's report from 1901 of an individual that had been hit in the side of the face with a bar, some kind of bar bat-like object. And it shattered and it killed him. And this individual matches age and demographic information for this. So likely the same individual that we identified. But you can see that being Chinese at this time wasn't always a good thing. And they had a lot of pathologies. Um, dental health was pretty good because they were eating traditional diets though. So that was a benefit, right? So some of the things too, and we don't, not just to accentuate the bad, they were like actively changing laws. They were actively engaging in their own communities. They were actively doing things. So there's actually a lot of really cool things that were going on, but the violence and discrimination was also a real, a real risk for them as they were trying to live in northern Nevada along one of these rail lines. Kyle Ranch is south of there in north Las Vegas, is another famous place because these were some of the early settlers of the area. So then in the 1890s, they were there. There were a couple of, these are some actual pictures of them on the ranch. They still have the ranch there. You can go see, they mostly foundation now. There's people, there's Kyle family still living in Las Vegas today, so they have contacted us, we talked to them. But these two main ranches in North Las Vegas, there's another one. So if you ever watch Bonanza kind of thing, or you saw the Hatfields versus the McCoys, this is like the real life, this is another real life version of that. They were two families in this area that were constantly feuding with one another. Um, at one point, the father gets sh of the other family gets shot on the Kyle Ranch property. And so obviously the wife blames the Kyle Ranch people. And we'll talk about it a little bit. But this is William and Edwin, two brothers. They are, one of them moved back east. We could tell which one he was because he had dental work done. And we could see the dental work. We can analyze the dental work. Um, we also, they're different ages, so that helps. Um, William was found with three ballistic injuries. Edwin with two. So they were both shot. 
No other trauma was found in 1899 or in 1975. We reanalyzed them again. They were, ex they were again excavated from the ground because they were expanding, they were building. It's Vegas, they're building more stuff. And they hit the bodies and they wanted to move them. So they went to the university naturally, which is odd, but they should get reburied, but we will. Uh, but these two brothers were often considered outlaws. They were the bad crowd, the rough crowd. They were known for drinking, as we're in a bar. Right? We're drinking. <laughs> but they were known for starting fights. They were known for being a little bit rowdy. So this is one quote from them, but like, if Parrish enjoyed the reputation of a gunslinger, the reputation of the Kyle Ranch was not much better. It was not uncommon for a rough crowd to congregate there. And on December 1st, 1894, a man named Gibbons was maimed when the side of his face was shot off during a quarrel over a card game by two men with a price on their heads. Gay and Butcher, right? So rough crowd. These guys were known for um, having some crazy parties in the time. Late 1899, the, ju the jury rules that the brothers, these two brothers are found dead on the, in their property. Doors are open. There are guns there. One of the guns is jammed. There's a round jammed in it, right? They're both, they're both dead, but a the, they have a coroner come out. The coroner looks at the bodies. Jury says this is murder-suicide. One of the brothers shot and killed the other brother and then killed himself. So... They had been, this stuff had been going rough and they were just, they just couldn't take it anymore. Problem was they were found by Stuart, Stuart's sons and Stuart was the one that was killed on the Kyle Ranch property a few years earlier. So there's like, hmm, that's kind of curious. So they were, they were dug up and they were reanalyzed and here are the two bodies. You can see there's Kyle Ranch again, two brothers. One of the problems with this story is that they were sh the way in which one of them was shot is he was shot in the back of the head at an angle that would be very, very difficult for you to do yourself. So the original forensic anthropologist that looked at these in 1975, Suchi Brooks being one of them, she said that these don't look like, this looks like they were murdered, both of them. He was shot twice, it was three times, there's three shots, but, so she thinks, you know, these guys were probably both murdered and they were found by the stewards, so it makes sense that if they, shot them, then they'd be like, yeah, yeah, no, they were suicide. That's what it was. This arm bone is one telling factor. He had covered his face to block an injury, injury consistent with, then he was again shot in the head, and the other brother was shot in the back of the head. When we reanalyzed it, we found a little bit more evidence to suggest that it was also kind of defensive. He was also, there was one single lone pellet in his back that when he was two scenarios, either a ricochet maybe, or he was at a distance when they shot him the first time, then they came closer and did the next two shots. We're trying to, we're looking at different ways to reconstruct that, but looking at ballistics, we've done x-rays to see, I mean, you can see it there, but we've still wanted to x-ray analysis. We're doing analysis of the lead. But these uh, two individuals for years, I mean, the plaques have changed now because they were the rough, wild ones that killed themselves. But now we know that more likely than not, they were murdered by likely the Stewart brothers for the avenge their father's death. But again, it's using forensic methods, bioarchaeological methods, and when the bodies were recovered, we analyzed them. And now they're gonna be reburied. The Kyle Ranch family's involved, the Ran Kyles, and so we'll hopefully put them back in the ground, but they'll have a new story to put up on the plaques because the Stewart family is famous in Las Vegas, right? There's a whole, their house is actually a better museum. It's a really nice museum. Not so much for the Kyles. It's like, hmm, maybe both should be famous. Anyway. Um, so the whole conclusion is that when you look at bones, there's life after death, that we can take human remains and we can analyze them and start to reconstruct periods. I've worked on, like I said, 2,000 year old sites in the Middle East where we have hunter, or we have agriculturalists that were fishing, but we find trade goods with all the other societies in the area where they're, they're a major port for trade and their bones are interesting. We can see all kinds of things. And then we have Southwest. I've worked at Chaco Canyon, where it's supposed to be a ritual site. Uh, one of my students is looking at cannibalism, where people are supposed to be eating each other, and we're deconstructing that to say that it's probably not cannibalism, but something else going on. But all of this is possible because we have bones, and we have ways of telling information from the bones. And so if you guys want to see the bones, you can come up and look at them. I have a lot of pathologies in here. This is the pathology box. I brought it because it's the most interesting, right? People are interested in things like this. This is the stuff that like ancient aliens puts on TV and they're like, look, Indiana Jones didn't do much better with number four, right? It's like, mm, not good. But if you look at this individual, you can see some other interesting trauma and indicators on the body. It's not just the trepidation. It's not just the head shaping. There's lots of information, a wealth of information that you can see on the bones. But if you have questions, I'll, I'll be up here, and then I'll show you the bones, and yeah, feel free to ask me. Thanks.
Question? Ready? I can't see. Yeah. That's a good question. Too many. No. He asked, what is my active like caseload? In terms of forensics, I'm not doing any forensics right now, but in terms of bioarchaeology, way too many. No. I have a lot. I'm trying to work on, I got one in the Great Basin with Fremont, a couple with Anasazi, Ancestral Pueblo. We're working on the Patella from Tullabrock. But I, what I try to do is get my students to take on some of these projects so that they can learn and then they can expand the research because I have way too many interests and so I will just keep studying them and I'll keep studying them and I'll keep studying them. But yeah, there's a few of them out there, but yeah. I took a class in anthropology at my last year of my psychology degree. It was a, she asked what got me interested in this. I got tricked, no. I was a psychology major. I actually got my bachelor's in neuropsychology, probably why I study TBI. But I took this class and they talked about human evolution and they talked about bones and I was like, I didn't know this was a job. <laughs> so <laughs> here I am. <laughs> anyway, and my wife kept saying, oh, follow your dream. I was like, but I make more money this way. Anyway, she told me to do it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, go ahead. That's a good question. <laughs> Always looking for more. No, she asked where the funding comes from. Um, it depends. Some of these projects, like the Kyle Ranch project, that was a development project. So the construction company was paying for some of this to happen, right? So we had the remains from that. The Chinese um, project, is there was development, but there's also that there's a big project at Stanford where they're getting Chinese involvement. So people in Guajang province are helping pay for a lot of this because it's their history, it's their people, and they want to know more. So there's, sometimes it's a unique places that the funding comes from. A lot of times development helps. <laughs> Is there a dream project or site? You know, I don't know. I like, I like everything. I really like working in Native North America prior to contact because the information is all oral tradition, so I like to reconstruct as much as I can of what's going on there. And just, I don't know. I'm just kind of open to whatever happens and where the remains are and who asked me to look at them, I guess. I'd, so no, no dream project. I, right, I'm getting started in Alaska. So I've been here for two years and I've worked on several projects out on the YK Delta and I'm continuing to work. We're looking to try to get some remains that are at the Smithsonian repatriated back to Alaska and given back to the corporation. So one of my, like, that would be my ideal project now would be to get those remains. There's lots of remains that were put in the Smithsonian years and years ago by people like, well, anthropologists that took remains back and so they could study heads and they sit there still, and one of my goals would be to get back. So I've been working a lot with local communities trying to expand relations, but always community-driven. I don't want to just study bones, because, yeah. Yeah, if they were willing to, she asked if we could 3D print the bones. If they're willing to, that would be absolutely. But if some groups don't even want that, they're not, they're not interested. But for the most part, I mean, a lot of that's been done. They've taken so many photos and cast of all these crania that are everywhere. But we do do analysis before we repatriate, and we do a whole new suite of analysis. And the methods that we have are constantly evolving and changing. They're getting better and better. So, or better or worse, they're always changing at least, <laughs> right? So we're constantly using new ones. We're trying using new technologies. So I have laser scanners in my lab that I use. I have a little connect from a video game that I use to make 3D models, all kinds of things. But constantly, whatever I can get access to, I try to use. Yeah. Oh, I can't even see over Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Right, so you asked about the Barrow burials. Um, there's actually a really good anthropologist that works up there. I was called by a colleague of mine, that, and I was told they were coming out, but there's a firm here in town, an archaeological firm, where they're handling all those remains, and they're doing a great job. They are out there. They've, they were out there the, when they first started coming out, and they started making sure those burials were preserved and nothing happened to them and collecting the information. So actually, we there's a lot of people that, and my goal is to train more people, students that can work in the communities and then go out to areas where it's hard to send a professor out when he's teaching classes, <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know, but as soon as I find that out, I'll tell you. No, uh, how can I tell if Bones are <laughs> their political right? I, you know, I don't know. I, I bet there's indicators. I'm just saying. <laughs> Right. Um, she's sitting right there. <laughs> State medical examiner. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the question was, uh, do I work with the medical examiner? The medical examiner, one of them, is sitting right here in the audience. But... Um, as of now, I don't work with the male because they have a forensic anthropologist they work with. But yeah, they do call on forensic anthropologists because there's things that you, they can see on bones sometimes that medical examiners either, I mean, they have lots of cases. So say they get to somebody that specializes in like minute changes in bone, that's, yeah, that happens. There's people out there that they're constantly, that they're working with and partnered up with. And I did it in Las Vegas and my friend's doing it still in Las Vegas. So yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a good relationship. Right, so she asked about, she works with 3D printing, uh, 3D digitization, and how 3D printing's changed things. It's made it amazing, because this right here is a real skull that you can now buy for $200, $250, but anybody can buy it. And they're supposed to be, the accuracy is supposed to be pretty good. Some people say that they, the company themselves claims that you can measure from it, and so it's been, it's been great. 3D printing has changed access for everyone so that if you're in Alaska, I can have a Peruvian, right? Then I can sit here and tell my students about it without just showing them pictures that they've seen or old slides or anything else. And then we can also rebury them so that we don't have to keep them around <laughs> like, like they've done in the past. Oh. Oh, good. I'll do him and then you. <laughs> right, well this is a, a status symbol, right? So you can only do this when you're a baby. So you wrap the head when you're a baby, like I wanted to do to Kel, but he's not gonna let me. It's too late now, can't do it. But you wrap, you wrap the head, and then this permanently marks you as a different social status, right? And so the, I'm going to a conference with a guy in two weeks, and that's his, his entire dissertation is studying differences in this shaping, and they're all different. They do different techniques and status. And so he's looking at Peruvian examples of this all over the place. He has several hundred examples, I think, of what he's looking at. What was your question? What keeps me going every day? <laughs> My family. Good question. <laughs> no, no, this one just happened to have, yeah. But they were doing brain surgery. The whole culture had a whole bunch of them. The trepanation? Yeah, the trepanation. Oh, the, uh, the, or the binding. Yeah, yeah. Trepanation is depends. There's one individual we have that has three of these, and the last one they didn't survive. So, <laughs> so it gives you a one in three, maybe? I know. Uh, two and three, you survive already. No, but they did have multiple that had healed, and then one that did not. So you can. Right, well, all kinds of things. There could actually be like trauma to the brain and swelling, right? And these, they do this today. There's also beliefs that like, sometimes you have to let things out and you could, they could do it. And there's lots of people, I mean, people have written entire books about what this means and what they're doing. And we don't know. <laughs> well, we've come up with some good ideas. Anyway. Thank yeah, thanks so much.